And we're live. Tom Lebecki here with the first ever New Jersey Digest, New Jersey Business Now. We have a group of five excellent individuals from different disciplines. We're going to do this monthly. This is our first one. And we're going to talk about real deal, no nonsense, what New Jersey entrepreneurs are doing and what they're doing now. So first up is Robbie Fleece. He's the owner of Viaggio as well as Osteria Crescendo, two restaurants in New Jersey. I'm particularly excited about this particular talk because he is in one of the toughest areas in the toughest segments of business. So without further ado, Robbie, Fe Robbie Felice, the floor is yours. Well, what's going on, guys? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know really what you guys want me to get into right off the bat. I mean, obviously, this pandemic has been um, insane in the restaurant business. You really get to see, you know, what people have to do to survive. Uh, my whole story through this pandemic has been uh, kind of a long one. Uh, you know, the pandemic hit and we instantly obviously had to close. Um, so we closed down both restaurants. Um, the day after we were, um, we had to close, I turned the one restaurant into a market. Um, I brought literally all perishables down to that restaurant. Um, everyone started doing it eventually, but I can honestly say, I think I was one of the first people to do it on that second day of, of shutting down. Um, we turned, uh, Viaggio into like a marketplace, you know, we're selling everything from produce to specialty products. I do all my own dry aged steaks and charcuterie and salumi. So we had like a dry aged steak charcuterie salumi bar. Um, instead of going to a grocery store where there was like, you know, thousands of people, people would come into our little market, you know, four or five people at a time. Um, and it did its job. You know, we, we didn't waste any product. We had money coming in. It was awesome to, you know, still have cash flow coming into the business. Um, and then, you know, after three weeks, that idea kind of died out. Everyone started doing it, you know, literally even bars were starting to turn their places into markets. So I quickly nixed that idea. Um, that was about the time that takeout and delivery became a thing. So instead of doing, you know, my fine dining Italian food, we turned Viaggio into um, like a high end sandwich shop. So we were doing all like super fun high end sandwiches, you know, pictures on Instagram was like huge, really got people to come by even people that weren't normally coming to Viaggio were getting like, you know, 10 takeout sandwiches at a time. I still remember it was like me one other person in the kitchen on like a normal Friday or Saturday night, we do about 50 or 60 tickets. I want to say that first Friday night that we did sandwiches, we did like 90 to a hundred wow. tickets, two of us in there um, selling these sandwiches. And, you know, when I say a ticket, I don't mean one sandwich. I mean, you know, like four or five sandwiches on a ticket. So this was crazy. You know, my dad's my business partner in this and we're like sitting back, like, Holy shit, this, this, this mm -hmm. might keep us alive. You know what I mean? Like this, this is going to be good. Um, so the sandwich idea kind of kept going. Um, it saved us up until the point of then the outdoor dining became a thing. So we we're still doing takeout delivery sandwiches, outdoor dining opened. We opened my second restaurant back up. So we were able to have both of them open at this point. Um, doing, like I said, sandwiches, takeout delivery, outdoor dining. Um, and that was about the beginning of the summer, like actual beginning of the summer, like June. Um, I decided to take a private chef gig out in the Hamptons to be able to kind of take myself off payroll. So um, I wasn't taking a paycheck from both my restaurants really helped to, you know, yeah. take myself off payroll and go make my money elsewhere. So I would basically drive out to the Hamptons. I would stay out in the Hamptons Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, I would cook out there for a family and make my money and then be able to rush back for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and make sure the restaurants were afloat, check on everybody, check on everything, do menu changes, um, you know, do the PR from the, for the restaurant, all that good stuff. So that got me through the summer, taking myself off, you know, helped out. Um, and then after the summer, I came up with two, uh, two new pop-ups that we did. One was like literally to save the restaurants again and to be able to pay me and my dad. Um, we did underground tasting Tuesdays, we'd call it. And basically at Viaggio, um, we, we used to have like a chef's bar where you would sit and, you know, I would just cook for you for the night. Um, and we didn't want to do it anymore just because it was weird, you know, getting up in people's faces, you know, talking to them about food. 
it wasn't so much, you know, you and if the people agreed with you and they wanted to do that, it was more like having guests kind of watching and like seeing that. So I said, you know what, since we're closed on Tuesdays, let's do this underground tasting Tuesday thing. We charged a lot of money. I'm still like insanely grateful that people even want to spend that amount of money to come eat my food and hang out with me. Um, so they would come to the restaurant, come to Viaggio, knock on the door. I'd unlock the door. I'd throw the iPad on them. Adam, I would say, play whatever music you want. And I would literally just cook for you. Um, tickets were like 250 plus gratuity. So it came out to like $300 a person. Mm -hmm. uh, we did like cash or Venmo only to just, you know, that yeah. was my way of, again, paying myself. And um, that literally sold out within three weeks. I was booked from November until the middle of April. Last week was my last one. Um, and then we actually started doing them on Mondays too, because we just got so booked up and we were like, this is crazy. Um, and then it led into my next, actually my next project that I've been doing. Um, it's, it's secret. Um, the chef is kept a secret. The locations kept a secret. The whole project's actually secret, but this is just me keeping my foot on the gas and, you know, pandemic or not, I'm, I'm a chef and an entrepreneur, like, you know, still trying to grind, still have dreams, hopes and dreams. And just because of the pandemic, I don't want to slow down or not open restaurants or not keep grinding. So, um, that's been my story throughout the whole pandemic. So there's a lot, there's a lot going on there. And I love that you were in like survival mode. You put your people first, willing to work even somewhere else, take yourself a payroll, make sure your people are paid, you're employed, make sure your father's taken care of as a partner. So a little about New Jersey now, what, so for example, you kind of change up the concepts of the two restaurants you have, like for survival mode, right? And then now you're doing well and you're going to continue to flourish, but moving forward, you're going to keep the concepts that were same pre-COVID or they're going to be a little different in lieu of COVID, the concepts. Uh, oh, we're like, we're, we're pretty much back to normal now. Sandwiches have officially came off the menu, which I was so excited about because it got to the <laughs> like yeah. so overdoing them. I mean, don't get me wrong. It was so fun during all this to see like, even like as a chef, I would go on Instagram and see like these Michelin star chefs having to cook like cheeseburgers. Like I remember we did, um, I do all my own dry aged beef. So we were doing like uh, double smash burgers, dry aged burgers and like, I mean, we literally couldn't make them fast enough. We were doing like, it felt like we were at McDonald's at one point. It was yeah. crazy. And, you know, the following week or maybe two, three weeks later, I go online and I'm seeing like the best restaurants in the world are doing burgers. And I'm like making a joke about it. I'm yeah. like, you know, going to my staff, my friends. I'm like, dude, that was so three weeks ago. I did burgers. <laughs> three weeks. Like it's about time they started copying me. You know what I mean? And, and it was funny because that's like just how it went, you know, like even now with, the whole pop-up thing. Like, I feel like I'm seeing so many more pop-ups and like I started the pop-ups back in November, not saying I'm like, you know, leading the way on doing it, but I feel like if you really kind of got, got in that curve early, it worked really well for you. And then you were able to kind of like move on to the next thing. Like I, I still remember to this day, the whole doing the marketplace thing. And as soon as I saw everyone doing the marketplace, I remember the look on my dad's face where I was like, no, we're not doing it anymore. And he was like, what do you mean? Like, we're doing great. And I'm like, everyone's doing it. We're not going to be doing great next week. We need to come up with something new. And that's when I was like, watch this. Like, look at these sandwiches we're going to do. And it just, it really took off. So you're a bit of a futurist. Any predictions that you made, were you wrong about? And then you had to pivot again? Or were you pretty spot on with everything yeah. that you did? I mean, yeah, I would never say I was wrong. Like, you know, if you notice something's not really working, you kind of change it a little bit, you know, even if it's not major, you know what I mean? Same with, with like business plans, you know, it's the same thing with opening a restaurant. If you yeah. see people don't like the food or don't like something, doesn't mean you completely change. You just kind of, you know, pivot it a little. Maybe you don't do the food that's so weird. You make it more approachable or, you know, you change the flavor profile. It's the same thing with, you know, business, a business plan, a restaurant plan. You know, you might have to tweak some things. And I, I mean, I can honestly definitely say that we had to tweak a lot during this whole thing. Um, hopefully I made it look easy on the outside, but obviously it wasn't easy by any means. True. If you have any questions, feel free to type them below. Uh, I believe you can raise your hand and even talk and ask a question. So either raise your hand, I'll look out to see if a hand's raised or answer a question below. We're almost done, Rob, with your portion. But one question I do have is 
now, right? So, so what are some of the tools that you're using? Are there different tools that you're using that you haven't used before? Are there different resources? Are you sourcing your food differently? Like give some advice to entrepreneurs could be specific to your industry, but apply to general business that you're doing right now differently than even than you did in April. Cause we want to get a feel for um, advice so we can unpack and take in our own industries. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely say that, you know, I saw across the board, like even talking to my, some of my higher end purveyors, you know, people were like cheaping out on food where they could, um, you know, I even had to make some cuts cost wise. So I can say in our industry, like people across the board were definitely doing that. I mean, obviously I wanted to be able to support my purveyors that always supported me. So we tried our absolute hardest to be able to give them as much business as we could. You know, they were getting hit just as hard as us, whether it was seafood companies, you know, some of my local farms, things like that. So we tried to keep using them as much as we could, but there were cuts that we had to make across the board. Um, I can honestly say that if it wasn't for social media and, you know, all of that, I don't think any industry's business would have been able to survive the pandemic. I think um, social media was everything, especially for restaurants across the board. You know, you see some of these higher, higher caliber restaurants that have, you know, hundreds of thousands of followers and, you know, they owe it all to social media. So I think social media played a huge role in the survival mode of kind of the pandemic. Um, and now kind of moving forward, you know, you see things every day that's like crazy where, you know, restaurants aren't going back to where they were, where, you know, they're staying more fast casual, they're trying to alleviate or cut out, you know, human contact and things like that. And I would definitely say, you know, that's going to be something big going into um, the future. Um, yeah, that's, that's really all I got. Well, I learned a lot in this short period, Robbie, uh, unless anybody has any questions, I don't see any as of now. I've learned a lot. I've been following you. I like that you changed up the menu. I, I liked how you brought up your vendors, you know, um, you know, to be candid. Uh, I haven't found vendors during this to be super flexible, uh, in my opinion. And I get they're beating up too, but there's a supply chain, right? Everybody's got to share a little bit. And what happens is there's some tough, tough relationships that and conversations you have that may either pause relationships or end relationships. But at the end of the day, you need to worry about your business and, you know, and move forward. And I like the fact that um, you brought up social media, Robbie, you're more than welcome to hang out as long as you need to. Um, next up, I'm super excited. We're going to talk about social media. Um, we're going to talk about um, IP, which is intellectual property. Again, Robbie, thank you again. And uh, we really appreciate it here at New Jersey Digest. Next, I want to introduce to you Francesca Witzberg, who is a partner over at Loza Loza. She's an IP attorney, and she will be speaking about social media, as well as um, IP, which is important for um, entrepreneurs, because what is something if you don't own it? Francesca Witzberg, wel welcome to uh, New Jersey Now. Thank you so much, Tom. And it's a perfect segue. Uh, Robbie's talk is a perfect segue into what I'm going to talk about today. So I'm just going to share my slides. Can you see those? I can, yes. Okay. All right. Great. So... <laughs> I think we just need to get right into it, right? Yeah. Disruption. So the, the 2010s, I would say, were marked by disruption. We had Netflix, Spotify, like these are, these are technologies and businesses that completely disrupted certain industries. And then 2020 comes. And not only do we have disruptive companies, we have COVID, which has literally upended everyone's life, all aspects of life, business, uh, restaurants, like Robbie was saying. And it was a very scary time. And, you know, the fact is, though, love that you had Robbie to, to begin because he, he put it bluntly, like, you have, you have to keep your foot on the gas. Yep. You have to pivot. You have to do what you need to do to survive. And as an IP lawyer, I am, you know, so grateful that I can tell you all that so many businesses have actually been able to stick it out and really flourish, but not maybe doing it necessarily the way that they were doing it in the past. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what I've done personally, because I also have made a big pivot 
And then I'm going to talk about some IP stuff. But Tom and everyone on here, please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions during. I just put these slides up because they're just easy to remind me of what I want to talk about. And I don't go on a tangent, but uh, feel free to interrupt me. OK, so we talked about pivoting. and. That's number one. I mean, I loved what Robbie said. I literally wrote this down, how he was saying he did pop-ups, do making it a market, sandwiches, and how he's so sick of sandwiches. I mean, like how many restaurants were thinking about doing delivery cocktails? Like that's super creative. And as business owners, we need to be creative, whether you're in the services industry or the physical services industry, such as, you know, restaurants and stores. So, I, you know, was thinking about what has helped me during this pandemic and what, what are skills that I think really everyone can use, whether or not you are a service provider or you're selling goods. So I made a move. I switched jobs. I moved to a new firm with zero clients in September. I used social. Again, another thing Robbie mentioned, social media is just, you cannot you can't write it off anymore. Maybe back, maybe five years ago, you could. Everyone needs to be on social media. If you're not using it yet for your business, you need, you need to start like today. So what I've learned is I've kind of come up with this like success cycle, right? So it starts with providing value and access. If you're like Francesca, I, you know, I have an account, but it's personal and I don't know if I should do an account. Just make an account, start putting up content, build a platform and put out value. So if you're going to say, Francesca, I don't know what to write about. I don't know what to post. Just open up your phone, take a video and talk. If you're an expert in an area, post that. If you have some sort of advice, you want to reshare content, curate content, whatever it is, but put that out there. The next step is tapping into what I call your opportunity funnel. This is the funnel that you've been building your whole life. And I have another slide on that. So I'm just going to go into the next step, which is growing that opportunity funnel, which then once you grow that funnel, you are eventually going to trickle in customers, clients, and any potential um, opportunities that are going to want to access you. And it goes right back to the cycle. How do you get, how can they buy your stuff? How can they buy your goods and services? Then you give them value and you repeat the cycle. So I want to talk about an opportunity funnel because I know I mentioned it. This is where you've been doing this your whole life. You've been networking since you were born, right? Your parents, friends, they've held you. You have babysitters. Like these are people who can hire you. These are people who can refer you for things. So any people on Facebook, if you tell me, Francesca, but I don't even have a network, you have your network already. And this is your opportunity funnel. Um, you're going to continue to network and build that funnel. I use the word opportunity because it's not just sales. Stop thinking about sales. You need to think about and focus on giving value and giving advice and growing your network. So that first step is really providing value and access. So this is really going to be for people who maybe don't have a big social media presence. I'm just going to tell you, number one, the first thing you need to do is build your brand. You need to know your story. Brands are stories. Good Business people and entrepreneurs are storytellers. I love hearing Robbie about what he was doing and how he's working with his dad and, you know, thinking about what he had to do to really survive in the business. Like there's a story behind that. Then I would say the second thing is you really need to give away advice and mentor. Um, it'll depend on your industry, but really you never know who you're going to help. If you give someone mentoring, they may be your next huge referral, or they could be someone who works in your kitchen. Whatever it is, you're growing your network, give value. And the third is really important, access. If you're putting all this stuff out on social media and you're not accessible and you're not clear about how they can buy your goods or your services or visit your restaurants or what you're offering, that's key. Um, what I do as a lawyer, I have a Calendly link in my Instagram bio where if you want to have a call with me, I offer up free 15 minute call. I'm happy to, to help clients or even just people who want to learn about the law. The next step is tapping into that funnel. What do you do? You check in. Check in with your friends, check in with your colleagues, be authentic, see how they're doing and set up what I call 15 minute catch up call. I'm sure people want to talk about themselves. This is really key. 
set calendar reminders in your calendar. Oh, I haven't heard from so-and-so in three months. Literally put it in your calendar and then ping them three months later. It doesn't need to be fancy. And then number three, send them things. If someone got a big promotion or they had a kid or they got a new job, send them something short. I send like cookies to my friends and it's something small and cute, but at least like you're, you're building these relationships and that's pretty key. Um, how are you going to grow that opportunity funnel in, in social right now? You got to build your platform. Get, get over the fear factor, just create content, see what works. I know a lot of people listen to Gary V. If you haven't yet, this is where to begin. Just start playing Gary V's YouTube channel and you'll get, you'll get the motivation and the advice. Speak on people's platforms. So this means de engaging, like when other people post, comment, start the conversation and put out content. The goal is to build authentic and long-term relationships. That's it. It's not to get to get sales. Once you start focusing on sales, you it, it, it's see-through. And I see Tom like <laughs> shaking his head, like yeah. totally. Like it's very see-through if you're not trying to build authentic long-term relationships. And that's why that word opportunity is important because it gets rid of the word sales and you're focused now on who knows, clients, referrals, friends, wives, like you, don't, you never know where it's going to lead to. So Tom, do you have any questions before I go into the IP part or are there any questions? No, no. I, I, um, I think that you are killing it right now. I'm super excited about that. I don't see any hand raises as of yet. So why don't we continue on IP? And then if anybody has any questions, we'll, uh, we'll ask it then, but so far crushing. I love it. I love okay, it. Okay, great. So IP fortressing, right? Well, I am actually, IP Francesca, for really quick. You and I are used to saying IP. Why don't we just say what exactly is intellectual property and give a little bit of background? Thank you. Yeah, I know. I get super excited about this topic. Mm -hmm. Sorry. So IP stands for intellectual property. Intellectual property refers to creations of the mind. They are your inventions, which can be protected by patents. They are your confidential business secrets. So if I know Robbie, maybe he invented like this sick, amazing sauce, doesn't want to share it with anyone except for his employees. That could be a trade secret. The Coca-Cola formula is protected by trade secret. Then there are trademarks, which protect names, logos, designs. These are things that indicate source. So they're names that you use to say, this is Tom Lavecchia's business. This is not someone else's business. Um, and lastly, for the purposes of this, copyrights. So copyrights protect your content, your photos, images, videos, podcasts, all that good stuff. So, you know, I feel like there's a huge lack of knowledge in this area for businesses. And I've really made it my mission. And I'm super grateful that you have me on here today, Tom, to talk very briefly about this. Um, I'm on clubhouse and I hear all these people bragging about how they're making seven figures, eight figures and growing business, growing content, but they don't talk about how to protect the name, how to pick a name, how you can prevent other people from using the stuff that you've built and created. It's so essential. And I'm here to really break it down as easy to understand as possible, because without this information, you know, you can play good offense, business growth all you want, but without your legal defense and what I call as your IP fortressing, you really, really are left exposed to a lot of liability. So IP fortressing, right? I do. Instead, it's not like I'm going to take cl tell clients to come use me and file trademarks. That's, that's not really the end goal. I want to look to see what everything you're doing. So I want to look at your websites. I want to look at your courses. I want to see what's going on. Um, I want to look at your contracts. And then we do an IP action plan. And then you go into your IP foundations where you file your trademark, your copyright, and you get a, your contracts. Super critical. So I just want everyone to understand this. Yes, you can go online and file your trademark yourself. You can go use LegalZoom. You know, I don't recommend that for a variety of reasons, but the point is that, that that's there. So how can you use lawyers to, to value add and give you that service? And this is, this is what I've figured out. Trademarks, like I said, 
Um, there's a couple things you can do. You can do quick searches. Check on Google and check on the USPTO. Use the TM symbol when you can. I, I, Tom's, I love this. Yeah. He's like, yep, got to do it. Yep. Um, and for any registrations, then you can use the R symbol. Quickly, again, with copyright, it's very similar, but copyright's even better. You don't need a registration to use the copyright symbol. So at the bottom of your website, on your PowerPoint slides, um, you should start using that little C symbol. I'll show you right here. I have the copyright notice with my year at the bottom, and it says Francesca Whitsburg. That means I'm the copyright owner. I own these slides because I've created it. Um, it's very important to get a registration because without it, you can't sue people. And lastly, contracts, you need your contracts. If you're, if you have employees, if you have consultants, just because you pay someone to make a logo for you does not mean you own it. You literally need to have a written document that transfers rights to you. So I don't want to take up too much time. I know you have amazing speakers, but I hope this was helpful. And if anyone has questions, I'm happy to answer. We do have one from uh, Paul Diano. Hey, Paul, I'm happy you're on. He's at last minute attendees. Thanks for being here. Francesca, do you have an example or examples of types of content you personally put out that led to new relationships and clients? Always. Clubhouse. Do you, do you use Clubhouse, Tom, yet? I do. I should be bigger on it than I am. I'm like in the podcasting lane. So it's a natural print, uh, transition. So I got to get I got to get on the boat. Yeah, I know it's very overwhelming. And it's like, oh, my God, it's one more thing. But I really recommend it. That is how I have personally have built my business. It's really through Clubhouse because it's one thing for me just to DM people and say, I'm a trademark lawyer and you should, you should care about your trademarks. Like no one cares. No one's going to see value in it. But when I do a panel with a top business coach, who's talking about making seven figures, and then she's talking about the name and I say, Oh, did you think about, did you do the trademark search? And then all of a sudden people are like, Oh no, I didn't check to see if my, I have my brand protected. Now I have that platform where I can talk. They know who I am and they can trust me. And then they want to work with me. So I have built by putting out that type of content, the audio and my videos on TikTok and reposting my TikToks on Instagram. I'm one providing value and access like that first step in that cycle, because I have in my LinkedIn bio, it's so easy. I don't need an assistant. I don't need to go back and forth. If you click on the link in my bio, people set up calls on your calendar. If you don't have Calendly yet, or a system, download Calendly. It is the best. Okay. I like how you mentioned tools. Before we wrap up, uh, one quick question from Casey. When do you draw the line between providing free advice and contracted work? This is so great. And we actually was in a room the other day about this. Um, there, is a, there is a line, right? For, for lawyers, it's a little bit easier because I could say, you know, you have to legally retain me. But for coaches and other business consultants, um, I would say be generous, especially at the beginning. You know, I was really doing a lot of, of, of free calls as I was getting started. And, you know, it may take up some of your time, but I will tell you that it absolutely has led Maybe not that person hired me, but a great example, this person had a call and I knew she wasn't going to work with me. And I could have been like really, you know, annoyed and blew her off, but I didn't. I helped her and she sent me work through a friend. So I would say at the beginning, do more of that until you build, until you're busy, then really start to, um, you know, be a little bit more conservative with your time. Love it. Francesca, thank you so much. And uh, we have your contact information here. We're also going to email everybody all the speakers' contact information. Francesca, you're welcome to hang out. Uh, great job and super excited that you were able to make it. Again, I love the Thank fact you. that you kind of sliced up social media, but also um, um, IP as a way to protect your brand and brand integrity. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker is, and this is, I, I, gotta, I, I'm, I can't believe we put a panel this strong this quickly, our next speaker, and I got to say he has nine lives. Here's why. Started out rough Brooklyn streets, got out there crushing a wall street. And then 07 or 09 came, got crushed. But not only did he kind of sit around and what was me and complained, but kind of got reinvented himself. And now fast forward to 2021 is a media entrepreneur, 
a real estate entrepreneur, a mortgage entrepreneur. I don't think I can give this guy enough credit in this short amount of time. Ralph DeBignara, welcome to New Jersey Now and super excited to hear your talk, buddy. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate it. And, and your intro is much better. I don't know if I live up to all that hype, but thank you for the intro. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, the last two speakers were amazing. Um, and, you know, I know we just got into some social media and we talked about we're on the restaurant industry. My real nine to five every day in the center of my universe is still kind of mortgage and real estate. Um, mortgage where I run a, a pretty large mortgage division. Um, and real estate where I have a significant portfolio at this point now, and I'm kind of all, just all in around real estate. And what the last year has really been spent doing, and like everybody else said, was kind of pivoting and readjusting my life to, to what the new normal is. And for me, it's been amazing, uh, you know, um, just because I think it's sped up the virtual process to kind of how we do business and how we communicate. And, uh, you know, it's, a, it's allowed me to, to touch a lot more things a lot quicker because, when we get on calls like this, we kind of get right to the point. We get a lot of information at once, or we get on a business call, people get right to the point because it's really a Zoom call now instead of a lot of in-person meetings. But it's allowed me to spread spread myself out a lot more than I was before because I'm not in the car all the time or I'm not flying all over the place. And uh, it's really helped. But you know, as far as the real estate and mortgage space goes, I'm sure, especially in New Jersey, what everybody's seeing is as a crazy, crazy market. And you know what I'm trying to do now is just put out enough free information to help people kind of access that. And we do that through Disruptors Network. And I'll get into a little bit of that. But, you know, it's a crazy market to buy in, but I still think it's a very, very good market to buy in. So just educating people on how to do that effectively, because that's a problem right now. But rates still being at historic lows and having an inventory problem at the same time. And by inventory problem, I mean that um, I think they put the report out this week that we're about 4 million homes short on what normal inventory looks like of homes for sale, which is an astronomical number. And, and the good and the bad of that is that it's very hard to find a home to buy right now. Uh, the good of it is that I think that it'll help the economy um, with everything that's looming right now with inflation and higher interest rates and stuff like that kind of stay um, status quo for right now until we dig out of what this is, which may take a long time. But in saying that, you still can buy a home. I still think it's a great time to invest in a home. And I'm still buying properties myself and even in some cases buying house under where they're valued. Uh, a lot of what I've got involved in this year in building my real estate portfolio is the short-term rental stuff. And if you looked at the Airbnb CEO speak this week, he said that um, they're still about a million homes short of where they need their their oh, wow. um, renters to be. So, so, so that's a huge number. He's still saying we're a million homes short of where we need to be to, to, to meet up with demand. And I'm feeling that in a lot of markets and even in New Jersey. Um, you know, I have a house on the Jersey Shore, obviously, which is an easier place to rent, especially coming up in the summer. But even my multifamily homes in towns that allow it uh, are doing very, very well because I think the new normal is people finding short-term rentals for them to find, um, to go just to get out of their house for the weekend or a staycation or whatever it is. Uh, I have properties in Greenwood Lake, which is in uh, Passaic County, which have rented really well. Then either in North Bergen, which is close to my office, because you can't Airbnb in Edgewater. And you can in North Bergen, and that's part of this process. People go to North Bergen. So if anybody has interest in, in doing that kind of stuff and you have any questions, um, I run into a lot of potholes on the way to building that portfolio <laughs> this year, <laughs> um, including where do I have to have a permit and where I don't have to have a permit. But what I'm seeing on return on investment for those who are interested in investing in real estate and building a portfolio, the short-term rentals... Um, where I was seeing on, on a good house between 12 and 15% on my money on, on a long-term rental, on a short-term rental, I'm seeing between 25 and 30%. Oh, wow. uh, it, and it's a lot more intensive to manage those properties. And I don't want anybody to think it's easy because it's not, um, because there's a lot of questions that come along with it and a lot of issues that come along with it. But like anything else, the more you work, uh, if the harder something is, the more money you'll make. So, so the, I really found that to be, a, especially in this market, to be a very, very successful strategy. Um, so I'm concentrating kind of on building that out right now. And again, if anybody has any questions about that, that's really worked well for me this year. Um, outside of that, we're building up Disruptors Network, which Tom has been uh, somebody who's definitely helped me along with that. And Disruptors Network is really um, a community-based business for me where we have uh, monthly webinars where we're, we're, we're bringing on pretty high-level entrepreneurs to speak about what they're doing in their business, um, how they were successful. And then we started a, a television show out of it that's streaming right now on Roku on, and Amazon and YouTube and Apple TV. And the focus of that show was not just real estate entrepreneurs, but any entrepreneur that 
um, was authentic to what they they were doing. Like I wanted to speak to these people with substance, and they were people who were really all self made, um, who had to overcome some kind of obstacle to get where they where they were. And I really wanted to show everybody that was watching that anybody can really do this stuff. You just have to put the work in, and and, and with all these people who are hardly successful at this point, that's what we really showed, and and that was part of what my story was. And Tom touched on it a little bit. Yeah. So that's and, and we're really and I'm focusing on Disruptors Network is now becoming um, not only a show but a leadership academy um, where we're going to be getting people licensed in real estate and mortgages and it's something that we're going to be paying for ourselves to try to create more leaders in our communities. So it's it's turning into something else and we're also launching another show in July um, that's going to be called Neighborhoods on our network that's on Roku and and all those networks that I just spoke to about and that's going to speak to how do you buy real estate in this market not pie in the sky, not HGTV, like how are we buying in this market right now and, and the obstacles that are being faced during that. So that's starting, that's going to launch in July and that's going to be a 12 week show to kind of examine nice. the markets that we're in and how you're buying in those markets. So that's now, I, uh, I have a the, question the, for the, you real quick. quick version. Yeah. A question sure. for you. So part of the reason why I wanted Ralph to come on is he's a real estate guy. That's his jam. And he, he focused on what he knows about. He, he does obviously do some great media as well. But, you know, there's different paths to wealth and prosperity. One of, the, one of those is, is real estate, whether, you know, whether we like it or not, uh, historically and even present day. For the, the people that are on, that are watching, whether live on YouTube or watching uh, on Zoom, um, real estate makes even me nervous. And I come from a family who, who family has real estate and that kind of stuff. But like even me, like I'm super nervous about getting the real estate. How can we kind of take a small bite of the apple and start out slowly and then maybe go bigger as we grow? Yeah, so so how I started in in, the, in buying real estate and what the safest play with me was, and and we have the option in New Jersey, so it's a good place to start. Yeah, is multifamily properties. Yeah, and you know that was really I bought something that I lived in, um, and that eventually became a long term investment thing. But I first bought something that I lived in, almost for free, um, where the, the renter was it was a two family. The renter was paying a big portion of my bills, and it, it was a low entry point for me because. As a, as a buyer, if you don't have an FHA loan already and you're willing to live in the multifamily, yeah. you can still buy a, a multifamily home, two or three family with three and a half percent down. Oh, wow. So it's a really, really low, a low entry point to get in. Um, and you can really cover your mortgage. And, and what I did with that is I used that to kind of move on to the next properties, but that always stayed as an investment for me. And it wasn't a, a high entry point to get in. Um, because I was able to put a low down payment down and I was able to have the rent cover. So that was, that's a great starting point. I recommend that for anybody that's going to buy for the first time, that's really the best way to buy. So also in, in terms of media and disruptors and, and everybody watching, we're going to send out links and stuff. So I watched, you know, all, all was it six episodes, all were great. And, and, and a lot of these people from the Jersey and a lot of people very gritty had different challenges and that kind of stuff, but beyond the whole like pivot exercise, which, which I keep talking about and I'm still on it. But people probably not tired of it. But but what you did was you went a little deeper to kind of unpack and extract, if you will, almost like a needle extracting what the success factor looks like. So can you maybe share some of the common themes that you got away after wrapping saying, oh, shit, you know, what? I'm a smart guy. I'm, I'm successful. But here's what I learned. And feel free to make a shout out for some of the people that you interviewed and what you learned from. Yeah, me. I think anybody that we, we interviewed and, 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 you know, it started with. Um, you know, Anthony Lolly, who was a big real estate guy, and yeah. then he lost 150 pounds, and now he's a fitness guy, and he's competing yeah. in bodybuilding competitions. Yeah. And it went to professional sports trainers, uh, who, a trainer for the Tampa Bay Rays, and, and Matt Sims, who's an NFL quarterback. Um, and then we went to the, one of the last guests was um, he, Fernando Mateo, who's running for mayor of New York City, and he had an amazing story. He started in business at 17 years old, and he's in his 50s now. So they all, But the common theme amongst all of them was really the same. Yeah. Um, they were all really self, they were all really self-starters who just believed they could build something. And then they, they really put hundreds and thousands of hours into it and, and just kind of worked every single consistently worked every day. And, and it's, you know, I know some stuff that sounds cliche. And, and when, when I first started having a morning routine, whenever I started a million years ago, I heard everybody say the same thing. You got to have a morning routine. And I was like, this, this is just something everybody says until I had a morning routine and I realized it worked. So, yeah. you know, the thing that these guys have always the same, they all had some kind of almost catastrophic event or, or dark point in their life that they hit where they had to, to get through it. And um, like me, who I've had, I had those moments and I had a pretty bad one in 2008 uh, was it ended up being the best moment I ever had in my life, but I had to see, see it for that and build out of it. So, you know, I think what I saw most of them all is that um, they were all self-made. 
they were all they all did it without a lot of help except the help they gave themselves and just working in that business every single day and then seeking out mentors to help them get to the next level and i think they all did that in some way shape or form so we've got two questions for you first ralph is, is paul again thanks again paul so ralph when did you first step into the real estate investing world and what is the number one thing you suggest to someone who is interested uh, in real estate investing but doesn't really know how to start i know you kind of touched on a little bit but if you could give maybe some of the tools um you know some of the resources yeah. that kind of stuff so I, I i'm in it i'm in it since i'm 23 and and that was good at 23 and then at 28 i lost a lot of those properties or i had to sell a lot of <laughs> properties because the market crashed so i saw the good and bad of that but um i think the most important thing is um, figure out what you're willing to spend every single month, not what the bank qualifies, qualifies for, what you're comfortable spending every single month. Because I think getting into real estate, the scariest part about it is not getting the financing, is not financing the house, is when that first mortgage payment comes for an investment property or even your own property, because it's almost like a payment shock. You know, it's like, well, I didn't realize there was all these costs involved. And just so you know, when a mortgage bank qualifies you for a mortgage, they don't take into account your cell phone bill or your insurance bill for your car or your utilities or your 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 Head kids' back, school yeah. or the super. They don't they don't take any of that into account. So you know they really qualify you at let's say forty percent of your gross income, but that forty percent could be really ninety percent of your income if you so like what I would suggest for anybody before you jump in is really write your budget out and everything, every single thing you spend every single month, like record everything. Like I, I, I go to Starbucks three times a week and I spend $60, like, and look at what you can spend and what you're willing to sacrifice out of that spend to be invested in real estate. Because I think that's the most important thing. And then go find an area. And now all the information is out there. So I mentioned Airbnb before. Yeah. Um, you can find what properties are renting for on realtor.com right now. So if you're interested in an area, go look on realtor.com and find what properties are renting. For Airbnb, there's a site that I use called AirDNA, where if you put in the zip code, it tells you exactly what houses are renting, how much they're renting for, and what percentage oh, wow. of the year they're renting for. So oh, wow. I, I don't walk into these houses blind. I walk in and say, okay, this house next door down the block was renting 60% of the year for $200 a night. Um, and this is what my, my income looks like if I come to this area. So you know, I'm conservative with those numbers, but the information is really out there right now for you guys to see where you can actually earn if you're going to you're going to invest in those properties or what's a good investment for you if you buy something and you want it to be an investment in the future. Great point. So for Ralph, in regards this is anonymous uh, for Ralph, in regards to home buying, do you think New Jersey mortgage rates will start to climb more? Uh, so they've been up, a, a, you know, a significant amount over the last couple of months, but they're still close to record lows. I personally think, and I don't have a, a you know a crystal ball, that over the next couple of months you'll see them come. They see them come back down a little bit, um, close to where they were at the top of the year. So close to record lows again. So I think you're going to see them creep down a little bit for right now because the increase was an uh, an overreaction to what was going on in the market, in my opinion, and that's what you're kind of hearing around. So I think you'll see them creep down a little bit until at least the end of the year. I think you will see a better interest rate over the next sixty to ninety days. Okay. Uh, Mario, you had a question. It got cut off. So feel free to write it below. Oh, here we go. Um, do you work with equity investors? I own Meridian Properties, a Hoboken uh, real estate developer. So I guess it's a business question. I don't know. Do you work with equity investors? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, you know, on bigger projects, I definitely take on equity investors. Before. I haven't in the last 12 months just because they've been smaller projects, but in the past, I have taken on equity investors on larger projects for, for sure. And, uh, and Mary, it looks like you're local and uh, afterwards we'll, we'll, we'll work to connect you. I just have one last question for you, unless somebody else has something. One of the things that drove the rental market was the inclination for millennials, which I think was not, not necessarily a bad move. Buying a house is expensive. It's high overhead. You got to cut the lawn, all these things. And the millennial sentiment for a while has been, you know, Hey, I'm just going to rent. I'm not going to own. I'm a, what do they call it? The sharing economy. I'm not going to have a car. I'm going to have yeah. an Uber, you know, I'm not going to have a house. I'll have a rental. However, like with COVID millennial house buying actually increased. I don't know what sparked it. Maybe millennials are getting older. I don't know what's going on. Um, so do you think Gen Z will have the same appetite for renting as millennials? I know you're betting big on the rental market. So you're showing that every day, but you think Gen Z will have as much of an appetite to rent as millennials. And if so, why? You know, I think so. I, I think that um, especially as we become, again, much more of a virtual society yeah. and more people are working from home, 
Yeah. I think that people are going to want to move from place to place more than ever. And to do that, they're not going to want to have long-term commitments, which is True. why I'm betting on the short-term rental market a little bit. True. So I think it's a combination of that. And the people who do want to own homes, they'll continue to buy because they want more space, you know, for a bunch of reasons. But a lot of people were awakened in this last 12 months that they wanted more space or they needed more space to work, whatever it is. But I think that because we're such a work from home society at this point now, and I, I see it staying that way to some, some extent. And also the other thing, Tom, is that, because we couldn't travel to Europe and out of the country and all these other places, people started finding places in their own yep. you know, sphere of influence staycation. where they could go and visit. Yep. Yeah, staycations. And with that, they developed new habits, right? So now, oh, I went up to the Catskills this weekend and it was amazing. I'll come back here. It's places they wouldn't have visited before and now they visited. So yeah. I think people develop new habits also. So I think because of those two things, yes, you will see the rental market increase. And, that, and that's why I really, I'm making a bet on it. I love it. Ralph, any closing statements before we move on to uh, Jeremy, who's in the wings, any closing statements? No, just appreciate you having me on. I think this is great that you're doing this and, and you always put out an amazing content. And if anybody wants to get in touch with me, um, you know, uh, my, my Instagram is great. It's at debug, D-I-B-U-G. And if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than, more than happy to answer them. Ralph, very generous with your time. Thank you so much. You're welcome to hang out. Thanks, Tom. And I uh, really it. appreciate it, buddy. Our next speaker, uh, really excited about as well, because uh, we learned about you know pivoting in the restaurant industry. Obviously, we learned about using social media to get the word out there. Once you have a great idea, learn to protect it with Francesca, uh, Ralph. A little bit more focus on uh, the blocking and tackling uh, in concern of the real estate industry, which is fantastic and a good way to uh, build wealth and income for you and your family. Now we're going to talk about kind of the how, how to make an impact, and our next speaker. Uh, is Jeremy Ryan Slate. Uh, where, where is Jeremy? Jeremy, you there? Uh, Jeremy Ryan Slate. And he's going to talk about five ways to uh, provide impact, right? And one quick thing about Jeremy, he's the CEO and founder of Command Your Brand. And he, to me, is one of the gurus in podcasting, a Jersey guy, one of the gurus of podcasting. He's not limited to that, but what I'm saying is if you listen to a podcast, check out Create Your Own Life. But Jeremy, welcome to New Jersey uh, Business Now by the New Jersey Digest. Man, um, I, I just gotten a lot. I've been in a long thread on Twitter for like two days on what's bet. What is it? Taylor Hammer pork roll. So I guess I, I don't know if we're going to settle that debate here, man. Um, but it's been it's been an interesting one. But I, I'll finish it with it is Taylor Ham. There, there's it's not anything else. I agree. But, <laughs> so I, I, I really appreciate you having me and I really hope we can, you know, help some people move forward here. Um, and I, I think one of the, I, I've been really doing a great job in the podcasting space over the years. I've been doing this since 2015 and it's gotten me a lot of like great media placements, a lot of influencers. And, and the reason I say that is not like to say, Hey, look at me. It's more or less to say like what I want to go over quickly with you here. It works in anything. It works in digital. It works in person. It works wherever it may be, but there's like really five concepts that build on each other that I want to go over. Um, oh, somebody says Taylor Ham here, period. Thank you. I appreciate that, Amanda. It is definitely Taylor Ham. I've been going back and forth with Chef Gruel on Twitter about it. It's been a lot of fun. Um, but anyway, like I think the first thing where a lot of business owners mess up, and this could be, I, I really like to concentrate on line since that is my world, but a lot of people don't, they don't look what's out there. They just come up with an idea. They just put it out there. And I did it with my first podcast. It was called Rock Your Life because I didn't realize somebody else had it trademarked and it didn't last very long. So you really need to start out first and foremost by figuring out what's out there. What are other people already doing? What are other people already saying? Yeah. Uh, what concepts are out there? Because once you know that, moving into the second part, which is differentiating, is really, really, really important. And uh, Tom, you and I both have a mutual friend, uh, David Breyer, yeah. and he likes to talk about you know, the idea between differentiation and blending in. And when you don't differentiate or have a difference of opinion or show how you're different, you're just with everybody else and you're not memorable. You promote your space and not yourself. So you have to really find out what's out there, then figure out how are you different and how are you going to ding that in? And I think it's a really, really vital thing to do. And I find that a lot of people, man, they get overwhelmed with there's this social media platform, this new one launched today or last week, and there's these 27 different other ones. And I find people get really, really overwhelmed with that. So once you identify what is already out there and you differentiate, just pick one platform, pick one. For me, originally, um, I looked at podcasting itself as a platform because to me, um, you know, I have a master's degree in history, so I wasn't really writing in ways that people could understand. So I could talk to people. I could do that. So I picked something that worked for me and that really worked for the way that I wanted to do things. And then I concentrated early on on LinkedIn 
That was the biggest thing to really get attention out there for me and help me grow what I was doing. And as I got followers there, I then moved into other places and started creating content for other places, but really just focus on one and don't overwhelm yourself. You know, maybe you're running a business. Maybe you have a small team. Maybe you don't have a team. Like you don't need to do all these things. Start in one place and really figure out, you know, what's going to work for you, figure out what's going to make an impact for you. And the, the, the really important thing you need to do is people are like, all right, well, what do I talk about? What do I do? What, what, what is the thing I'm going to, I'm going to do? Well, hopefully at this point you have customers, like you should be serving your customers. And if you do a lot of your sales, you're actually at an advantage, right? Because you know what people's objections are. So make a list of everything that people object to you about in your niche or things people need to know in your niche. And that's the content you're going to create. You know, maybe there's a certain reason people don't move forward in sales with you and it has to do with trust. So you're going to talk about that thing having to do with trust in the content you create, whether it's a video, whether it's a long post on LinkedIn, whatever it is, all of your content should be around objections people have to buying your product or service because it's going to handle that. And it's going to, when the people come into the sales cycle, it's going to be a much, much easier conversation. And, we have absolutely Taylor Ham. I agree with you, Michael Scavoli. Absolutely there. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I have to interrupt my train of thought there, though, brother. And then the other thing, too, is like once you've got those objections down and you've started to create some content, because as we said, you're differentiating. So if you were an expert in your space, you have something to say. So, you know, whether that's writing a blog, whether that's the stuff you're posting on LinkedIn, that's where you're going to be writing about those objections and those things that people get stuck on, right? One of our biggest ones that we get is um, people talk about radio advertising versus podcasting. So we talk a lot about the differences between the two and why that's not actually an objection. So you want to think about that in the content you're creating. And then you want to really look into like, how do I amplify what I'm doing? How do I get out there in a bigger way? And I like to tell local businesses, you're actually at a huge advantage. And a lot of people don't actually see it that way because you have what's known as a small palm. You have a small community that cares about you, whether it's um, a small local newspaper. Like I grew up in Hamburg, New Jersey, five eighths of a mile in size, nothing happens there. So like literally nothing happens there. So if you wrote a press release, sent it to the local newspaper, where they would print it without editing anything. Yeah. So you really want to look at what is the small pond that you can have a really big impact in. So I tell people, make a spreadsheet of this and list those out. What, what you know, maybe it's a newspaper. I live in a lake, so we have a beautiful magazine that goes around to the lake community. Uh, maybe your university does. Um, so you want to list out the different places you can do that and write press releases to those places because you'll find that you get in their print version you also get in their digital and their digital is actually what really helps you because it's going to help to rank your website. You can store those pieces on your site. So you're kind of amplifying your content in this way by getting out locally. And those releases may get you some bigger pickups. Like my first time on TV was a uh, producer had read it in the newspaper. and was like, oh, podcasting, that's interesting. So you always want to think about every piece you're getting should get you your next piece. So as I said, it's really, it's not simple. It does take a lot of work, but the actual blueprint and how to get out there is to find out what's out there, differentiate, pick one platform, um, you know, and, and really concentrate on that one platform, create content around your objections and figure out what's out there and amplify it. It could be small local press pieces. Like I said, start moving on to smaller podcasts, 20 episodes or less, less than 50 reviews. And you're going to have an easier time doing that. When you do that, you're going to get your content out there in a way it can really be seen, heard and make an impact. And it's something any one of us can do, no matter if we have no employees or, you know, one employee, whatever it is. Yeah. So to me, that's really how people should be amplifying impact. One, one quick comment. Uh, yes, sir. Aside, aside for the Taylor Ham, uh, Francesca was here earlier. Um, she, and, and she brought a good point. You need to see if a name is available for trademark search. And I've done that in the past. That's personally. really smart. There's like a piece. So, so, so I'll, yeah. I'll tell people yeah. here, you actually helped yeah. me out with that. Cause when yeah. I started my current business, um, it wasn't a trademark issue, but it was somebody actually already owned the URL. Yeah. So like one of the things I'll do besides trademark searching now, you know, cause I did make that mistake early on. Hmm. It's also find out like, does somebody go, I'll go over to GoDaddy and I'll see is that website URL owned. Um, and you know, our website now commandyourbrand.com. We originally had commandyourbrand.media, which was not good for getting found in search. Um, and then you actually helped us with, you know, getting ownership with the current URL, but that's your virtual real estate. You got to think about like, how easy it is it for people to, you know, find my business online and not only having to worry about trademark issues. Great point. 
Great point. Any, any questions for Jeremy, drop them below and put it here. Uh, continue a little bit more, Jeremy, because I do have one or two questions for you. Well, no, that's, that's what I got. So go for your questions, man. All right. So I want to keep it, I want to keep it simple today. Yeah. So one of the things that um, we talk about, like in terms of marketing channels, right? You may yeah. do Google and all this kind of stuff, right? And then, you know, your lane, you bet pretty big on podcasts and get paid off, right? And then Francesca just alluded earlier that she's like, you know what? I really like uh, Clubhouse, which is a new, a newer one. And uh, I've been on there. I got to probably get a little bit more adapted. So give me a minute or two on how do you find your, like, be, like to be honest with yourself, right? Because I work with some folks that are great and they're excellent writers, right? But yeah. they're not big on like, hey, doing selfies and that kind of stuff. So, so they write and they write well. So they write articles and blogs and so forth. So give us a moment, like, how do you come to realization? How do you find your lane? And be honest with yourself. And then if so, what are some of the mediums that you recommend for those type of people? You know, that's, that's a really great question because there's not really a methodology behind that other than to do it, right? Like, you know, if you try some writing and you don't like writing and it's not going really well for you, then write, maybe writing's not your thing. Yeah. Um, like even for me, like I know you and I have been talking about recently how I've shifted some of the content I cover in my podcast and we're almost 900 episodes in. It took me a long time to find my voice, be comfortable with my voice and, and kind of, um, you know, discuss some of the things I want to discuss. Um, so I, I think to me, the only way you find these things is by doing them. Like, what do you enjoy? What do you find you have natural inclinations to? Um, you know, what do you not like doing? Because if you hate something, I wouldn't really recommend doing it. Like I mentioned early on, I was an academic writer. So I write a lot now, but in the beginning, I didn't really have that skill. The skill I had was talking to people. So I had to just do that because I was good at it. Mm -hmm. And I, I went from there to really writing better marketing type pieces, but it took me three years to learn how to do that. So I think you have to look at what your natural inclinations are, what you're comfortable with. And you, to me, you really only learn that by doing it. I don't think there's any magic to it. That's why I'm, I'm not always a big proponent of, um, you know, learning everything you know about business in school. There's some things you're going to learn, but most things you're going to learn by doing it, man. Like yeah. until you have to figure out how to make payroll work, you don't really know, know how things work. Now, you also, for example, have bet pretty big on podcasting. Um, there is... I'm getting some questions from text. I'll ask them to put it on here. Um, what I think about podcasting is, is growing rapidly. And you're mm -hmm. like, one of the things is you're saying like growth, but like, you don't need, I mean, you could, you don't need to be big to have a podcast, right? Like you said earlier right. about getting on podcasts, but like, what are some of the reasons why should you start a podcast? How easy is it? And just talk a little bit about that because um, podcasting is way hot right now. It's going to stay yeah. way hot. And I think the barriers to entry are much lower than perceived. So if you want to give a little bit of flavor to that. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because I think like people say my, see my setup now and like, I've spent a lot of time, a lot of work on this, but it's yeah. only like in the last year yeah. before that I was, um, I was really just using a $60 mic and things like that. So the barrier to entry isn't super high. Um, one of the things that you really need first is a hosting account. So that's a place yeah. where you store your files and it goes out to these places like Apple podcasts and Spotify and things like that. Um, anchor is out there. It's a free one. Um, my history podcast is hosted on anchor. Yes, I did finally do that. I have a history podcast. Yeah. Um, but the one I use is called Libsyn. It's a little bit more pricey, but it's got a really, you know, really great functionality and things like that. So you need a place to put your files. That's one part of it. Um, the other thing is you need a decent microphone. Like I said, you can get a decent microphone for around 60, 70 bucks. Um, this one here is more of a higher end one. This is like a 400 and something dollar mic. This is a, a sure microphone, but I didn't start out with that. It's, it's, you need to really figure out the basics of it. Um, if you want to do editing, great. If you don't want to great. Um, but early on my first editing, um, on my MacBook was done on a $4 99 cent program called GarageBand. So you just need to have some of those basic things like that. And in terms of like your content, you have to decide like, what am I going to do? Am I going to have an interview show, which I recommend people do because you're connecting with other people. That's vital. Um, am I going to have a content driven show? What is that going to look like? Which requires a lot more planning. So you want to really get your head around that, but really it just comes down to recording, getting your episodes basically edited and uploaded. So that barrier to entry is super small because I covered a couple things there that cost like what? 110 bucks and you're kind of rocking and rolling. So you really want to take a look at it that way. Um, but understand like the content you're creating, there should be a professional bend behind it, meaning that you're treating what you do as a professional so that you make an impact with it. What, um, I got some people are texting. Me. So, so some people like to, to speak, you know, like they like to speak, right. But they're scared yeah. crap of speaking in front of audiences. And although 
right now you might do a podcast by yourself or you might have a podcast with somebody, although you're not doing a live to an audience like we're doing now, there still is a fear of public speaking. No, it's going to, knowing it's going to be public. What's a yeah. way to get over uh, one of the, what's a w- way to get over that fear? Just more conversations, man. Like, like um, I've spoken in front of hundreds and thousands of people, like all over the country, like on stages and things like that. But like when I started the podcast in 2015, I hadn't spoken in front of anybody before. And one of the biggest things was just getting comfortable with conversing. So just having more and more and more interviews and then starting to go on some podcasts myself and getting comfortable with that. Once you have that confidence, I'm a big believer in confidence in, in competence leads to confidence. So the better you get at something and the more you do at something, it leads to confidence. So it's a lot harder to be nervous when you feel like you're confident in something. So to me, it was having more conversations and continue to do that. And also getting myself in front of other media where I felt comfortable with that. So I'll, I'll tell you what, man, the first time I was on TV, I'd never done it before. I laid an egg. I just started stuttering. Um, when somebody asked me a question, I was trying to remember like the word concentration for talking about what my concentration was in college. And I was like, my, uh, 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 uh thing I studied. So like, you really, you know, you got to do it, man. It's the only way you're going to get around it. All right. We got some questions coming in here. We have anonymous attendee as a question. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to, I was going to say it, it's a, uh... You can, I didn't even know you can, you can hide them. All right, Jeremy, how do you feel about Instagram live to complimenting podcasts on your platform? So I haven't done a ton of it. I just started doing it recently. And, and honestly, it hasn't even been my own interviews. I've had um, people have been bringing me onto their platforms to do them. So like I just did one um, last month with the art of charm, which is a pretty big podcast. I was on their Instagram live, which is fun. Um, so to me, I'm, I'm not quite sure on that yet because for me, I don't like doing a lot of live content. A lot of my content is taped. We like to edit it down and make sure it's nice and smooth and everything like that. So I think there's some potential there. I just know for me, um, you can't have all the tech behind it. I like to have behind it, like the microphones and things like that. It's just, it would take too much work and it has to be done on a mobile device. So I'm sure you could do it. It's just, and I've done, you know, a few as a guest, but it's just, I, I, I don't, not something I'm really big on right now. Got it. All right. So what, any questions anybody else has for Jeremy, it looks like Eric, I just got a, a message from his uh, manager. He's having some technical difficulties. I don't know if he's going to make it. We'll give another minute or two before we do that, but let's fill up the air with some good questions. Anybody, any questions, Francesca, if you're still around, um, if you want to jump back on, but if any questions uh, for myself as a panel, as a host or for Jeremy, um, we can answer some questions, give Eric an opportunity to come on. Hopefully he'll be able to make it. Eric is the man, by the way. I I got a chance to interview him like two years ago. His story is incredible. Yeah. And and that's that's why we're super excited. So like, okay, we'll give them out of of respect. Give them another another minute or two. Sure. Um, What what again? Again, some people. (laughs) I don't know whether or not using Zoom, but I'll 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 read it from here. Um, Give me the relation between your podcast. And then like YouTube and visual platforms like like YouTube, et cetera. Do you just do audio and then maybe do separate content for video? Or do you just do one piece of content? Remember like the old Howard Stern, like film it yeah. and upload it? Or do you create, hey, here's a podcast audio and then maybe do something separate for video? How do you know what to put on each channel? So I'm going to blame you for this because you made yeah. me do this. <laughs> um, I did audio only for five years. And then about six months ago, we started doing video and we'd been kind of like, we've grown substantially, but we kind of like the growth curve had really slowed down with audio. Yeah. And we started doing video about six months ago. um, And we've seen our view numbers have been going up. We've seen, um, you know, our, our, I haven't been really big on YouTube, but you know, we're almost up to a thousand subs on YouTube doing that. So like, we're starting to see a lot of growth. So we make two different versions. We make a video version of the podcast where I do a video intro for it and everything. And then we take that, the audio from the video intro is what we use for the audio for the podcast intro, but we have an audio only and a video only version. And I'm finding that, um, the, we make a, a couple th- 30 or 60 second teaser clips for the podcast episodes we edit. And they're usually video with me and the guests. Those do really, really, really well. And they're also good for positioning, um, from the, from the standpoint of like either who you're seeing with or who the guest is seen with. So it's just something to think about in the content you're creating. Hey, Francesca, can you hear us? I can hear you. There's a question for you, but do you have any questions for Jeremy before I shoot off your question that somebody asked? Yeah, I do. Hi, Jeremy. I love Hi. everything you're saying. I love the background. I just Thank took you. my Thank virtual you. background down, but I, you're inspired. Oh, this is an actual like studio one. Yeah, I, I don't even know what to call it. I guess it's not a virtual background. It's like a print background. I love that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like it's just a step and repeat. Nothing crazy. It's awesome. Um, so actually, Tom has been 
really pushing me to do a podcast. I have, I run the Instagram account, the trademark attorney. I put out like fun TikToks and educational videos on intellectual property law, but um, I only do an Instagram live show Mm -hmm. up until recently. Mm -hmm. And now we're recording content. We haven't even launched the podcast yet, but my question is what advice do you have for people who love doing video and live? Um, What advice do you have as they start podcasts? So I guess from the standpoint of like, translating what you do to a podcast, to a video podcast, an audio podcast, just, just so I have clarification. So I can give you the best information. Well, the, the opposite, the opposite of what you did. She's saying, Hey, like, cause I'm pushing Francesca, right? Sorry, Francesca. I'm like so excited. No, no, yeah. She's killing it on live, right? She's killing it on Instagram and she's doing all the great things, video, TikTok, those channels, she's crushing it. But I'm asking you trying to pull her to go back to the audio side or okay. the video side of podcasting. Yeah, I do the opposite. I don't, I don't do very edited. I'm very unscripted. I'm kind of like improvising. So what advice do you have now for like editing and doing podcasts? So um, I guess, first off, do you plan on doing an interview show? Are you going to be like, okay, so this is a topic we're discussing today and like something you need to know um, about this having to do with trademarks or whatever. I'm going to do both. Okay. That's, that's a great. So I recommend to people that like you, you don't just do like an interview driven show because like, you know, like the problem I had early on is people really like the guests, but they knew nothing about me. So I find that what happens is you start your week with a guest and people come for the guest. And then, you know, you end your week with what you have to say and, you know, the content you want to talk about. So it really allows you to elevate yourself in that way. In terms of like structuring interviews, I used to go crazy in the beginning. So I had like 60 something questions for somebody I was going to talk to, which is insane. Like you're never going to cover all that. And what I eventually got down to is I would just come up with five bullet points and we would just kind of talk around that. And I find, honestly, at least for myself, the best part of an interview is the follow-up question. So you're looking at the, the things that you're going to ask or actually setting up the thing you want to ask after you get that answer. That's where you really get the gold in an interview. Um, and two, like in terms of like what's already out there, there's a couple different shows I would take a look at if I were you and just see how they're doing it. Um, Business Bites with Rachel Branke is a great show. I believe she's also a trademark attorney. She's awesome. Um, and you may also want to talk at, or look at can't remember the name of her show, but Heather Pierce Campbell is her name. She's another um, attorney in that, in that area as well. She used to, I believe she worked for Lewis house. Um, so she's done a lot of like his intellectual property stuff. So you can kind of see what out, what's out there, see what you like, see what you don't like. And it kind of gives you something to pattern off of. Amazing. I wrote that down. I have to check it out. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. So it looks like Eric's having some challenges. Um, thank you everybody for being on. Um, you know, we really appreciate it. It's going to be on YouTube. It's going to be available there. We'll send uh, everybody the panelists' information to be on. It was a really great panel today. Anybody have any questions, they can put it below before we conclude. Um, I'll just give you guys w- one more thing. And I just want to leave you guys with one. Thank you, everybody, for attending. New Jersey Digest, historically, like a lifestyle magazine. We were launched in New Jersey. So we are really proud about our Jersey roots. Uh, we're going to start doing some business topics, some lifestyle topics on um, – on video as well. So stay tuned for that. And, uh, you know, I guess we, I don't think we have any questions. So Jeremy, Francesca, uh, Robbie, who um, had a lot go off as well as Ralph, uh, really appreciate every, you guys very much. We'll continue to stay in contact in terms of the attendees. Again, this will be on YouTube. We'll send you the panelists information if you guys want to reach out. And thank you guys for being on the first episode of first edition of New Jersey Now by New Jersey Digest. Thank everybody. Thank you.